today's class we will conclude our topic cerebrovascular diseases in today's class we will discuss about the stroke syndromes so the stroke syndromes have been class broadly classified into three groups first the large vessel stroke within the anterior circulation second large vessel stroke within the posterior circulation third is a small vessel stroke involving either the anterior circulation or the posterior circulation so what is anterior circulation what is posterior circulation we will discuss in the subsequent slide what is anterior circulation so the internal carotid artery and its branches comprises the anterior circulation of the brain so we all know that the, the arch of aorta arch of aorta from first is the brachio right brachiocephalic artery from the brachiocephalic artery right subclavian artery and the right common carotid artery then there is a right a left subclavian artery then there is a uh, sorry left common carotid artery and then there is a left subclavian artery so the common carotid artery gives rise to the anterior carotid artery and the external carotid artery this anterior internal carotid artery and its branches forms the anterior circulation of the brain so in the brain there are three main main cerebral arteries anterior cerebral artery middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery out of these three main cerebral arteries anterior and the middle cerebral artery arises from the internal carotid artery and forms the anterior circulation so the occlusion can the can be due to some athero sclerotic uh, disease or can be due to embolism so as we all know that the occlusion can be a uh, emboli emboli or can be due to thrombosis and occlusion of each major intracranial vessel has got distinct clinical manifestation when the anterior cerebral artery occludes when the middle cerebral artery occludes or when the posterior cerebral artery occludes it the patient will have got the different clinical features first is the occlusion of the middle cerebral artery so occlusion of the proximal middle cerebral artery or one of its major branches is most often due to an embolus rather than the intracranial atherothrombosis so occlusion of the middle cerebral artery is mostly due to embolism rather than the thrombosis and there is a collateral formation by the leptomeningeal vessels which prevents the mca stenosis from becoming steno symptomatic so this is the beauty our of our uh, body that whenever there is a occlusion in any part of the body the collaterals are formed and these collaterals prevents the uh, circulation to the affected part same here same here say, uh, here when the middle cerebral artery occludes or or one of its branches occludes there is a formation of collateral vessels and it prevents the mca stenosis from becoming symptomatic so symptoms of any or uh, any patient depends upon the collateral formation if the good collaterals are formed then these symptoms will be minimal but if the collaterals are not formed or they are not poor, not good then the patient will be more symptomatic and the middle cerebral artery it has been uh, it has been uh, broadly uh, categorized into two segments m1 segment and the p2 segment m2 segment same the posterior cerebral circulation and the anterior cerebral circulation uh, are due to uh, according to our convenience we have uh, divided in the, into these two segments one is a pro, uh, proximal segment which is known as the m1 segment and second is a distal segment which is known as the m2 segment so the proximal mca also known as the m1 segment it give rise to lenticular striate striate arteries which supplies the following and putamen outer globus pallidus posterior limb of the internal capsule adjacent corona radiata and most of the caudate nucleus so these part of the brain are supplied from the m1 segment and there is a m2 segment what is m2 segment when the in the distal part distal mca it divides into superior division and the inferior division and the superior division of the mca supplies the frontal and superior parietal complex while the inferior division supplies the inferior parietal and temporal complex so there are main two main two segment of the middle cerebral artery m1 segment and the m2 segment and occlusion of the entire mca at its origin with limited distal collaterals leads to the following clinical findings when the middle cerebral artery occludes at its origin and the collaterals are not formed then the patient will have the contralateral hemiplegia contralateral hemianesthesia homonemous hemianopia 1 to 2 day gauge preference to the ipsilateral side and dysarthria so this these are the features when the patient has have an occlusion of the um, middle cerebral artery at its origin and when the dominant hemisphere is involved then there will be a global aphasia 
global aphasia means the patient have bruges as well as wernicke's aphasia and but when there is a non dominant hemisphere in, involved the patient will have the anosognosia along with constructional apraxia and netlet so these are the difference when the when the dominant hemisphere is involved and when the non dominant hemisphere is involved so majority of the majority of the persons are right handed so the left hemisphere is dominant but in some cases when the patient is left handed then the right hemisphere becomes dominant so this is this is these are this is the meaning of dominant hemisphere and the non dominant hemisphere so these are the features when the middle cerebral artery occludes at its origin and what is complete syndrome and what is partial syndrome complete when there is a complete occlusion of the middle cerebral artery and when there is incomplete occlusion of the middle cerebral artery or there is a good collateral formation that is known as the partial syndrome so this is the meaning of complete syndrome as well as the partial syndrome now come to the next part that the anterior cerebral artery same the anterior cerebral artery is also divided into two parts a1 segment and the a2 segment a1 segment is pre terminal and a2 segment is pre post terminal this a1 segment it connects the internal carotid artery to the anterior comminuted artery it gives rise to deep penetrating branches which supplies the anterior limb of the internal capsule amygdala anterior perforate substance anterior hypothalamus and inferior part of the head of the caudate nucleus so these are the brain parts which are supplied by the a1 segment of the anterior anterior cerebral artery a stands for anterior cerebral artery m stands for middle cerebral artery and p stands for posterior cerebral artery and the a2 is the post terminal that is distal to the anterior comminuted artery and occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery it is usually well tolerated due to collateral flow through the anterior comminuted and through the middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery whenever the post posterior or the middle cerebral artery occludes the patient will have more clinical manifestations rather when the patient has got the occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery because the anterior cerebral artery has got the good collateral formation now come to the other another third part that the anterior choroidal artery whenever there is occlusion of the anterior choroidal artery it also leads to the stroke within the anterior circulation the anterior choroidal artery it arises from the internal carotid artery and it supplies the posterior limb of the internal capsule and the white matter posterior lateral to it through which genicolo calcarine fiber spices and anterior choroidal strokes are often caused by the in situ thrombosis and iatrogenic occlusion during the surgical clipping of aneurysms arising from the internal carotid artery so the occlusion of the internal anterior choroidal artery it usually due to in situ thrombosis and due to the, the clinical picture it depends upon the cause of ischemia whether the cause is due to thrombus embolism or the low flow and the cortex is supplied by the mca territory is affected most often and it may go unnoticed with a competent circle of willis so the occlusion of internal carotid artery also leads to the stroke within the, in within the anterior circulation now come the next part that the occlusion of the common carotid artery the occlusion of the common carotid artery also leads to stroke within the anterior circulation and the sign and symptoms are same with the internal carotid artery occlusion there will be jaw claudication and when there there is a bilateral common carotid artery occlusion it leads to the takayasu arthritis now come to the posterior circulation so anterior circulation when the occlusion is in the internal carotid artery common carotid artery anterior choroidal artery anterior cerebral artery or the middle cerebral artery and what occurs when the stroke when the occlusion occurs in the posterior uh, cerebral artery so there is a lead into the stroke within the posterior circulation so what is posterior circulation so the posterior circulation is composed of paired vertebral arteries they joins to form the basilar artery and it divides into the paired posterior cerebral artery just go into the anatomy so there is a subclavian artery right subclavian artery and the left subclavian artery from the left uh, from both the subclavian arteries two vertebral arteries arises these vertebral arteries joins they form the basilar artery and this basilar artery it divides into the posterior cerebral artery so whenever there is a occlusion in any of this part it leads to the stroke within the posterior circulation and the features of stroke within the anterior circulation are very different from the stroke within the posterior circulation in the anterior circulation usually the paresis hemiplegia or the para hem hemiparesis part is more more prominent rather than the stroke within the posterior circulation in when the, there is a stroke within the posterior circulation usually patient will have more uh, 
more uh, nausea vertigo vomiting rather than the paresis so this uh, this is the anatomy and these arteries give rise to the surf- circumferential and deep penetrating arteries uh, which supplies the cerebellum brain stem dentifilon hippocampus medial temporal and occipital lobe an occlusion of the each vessel produces its own distinctive symptoms now come to the occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery so there is a posterior cerebral artery usually originates in from the uh, from the basilar artery per, but in majority of cases it happens in 75% cases it originates from the bifurcation of the basilar artery but there are some anomalies also in the anatomy in 20% cases one arises from the ipsilateral internal carotid artery by the posterior terminating artery and 5% cases both arises from the respective ipsilateral carotid uh, internal carotid artery so you should know about the variation in the anatomy also in majority of the cases it but it arises from the basilar artery and when the uh, posterior cerebral artery occludes it leads to the posterior cerebral artery syndromes and this posterior cerebral artery syndromes usually results from atheroma formation or emboli which lodges at the top of basilar artery and it may also be due to vertebral artery dissection or fibromuscular dysplasia so these pca syndromes may be due to embolism may be due to thrombosis may be due to dissection or due to fibromuscular dysplasia and these these are also they subdivided into two parts p1 syndrome and the p2 syndrome when the occlusion in the proximal part it is known as the p1 part or the, when the occlusion in the distal part it is known as the p2 p2 syndrome so p1 syndrome is involved in the uh, midbrain subthalamic and thalamic signs and due to disease of the proximal p1 segment or its penetrating branches p2 syndrome have in the cortical temporal and occipital lobe signs and it is due to occlusion of the p2 segment distal to the junction of the posterior cerebral artery with the posterior communicating artery so this is the p1 syndrome and the p2 syndrome of the posterior cerebral artery apart from the occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery there may be occlusion of the vertebral artery and the posterior cerebellar arteries these occlusion also lead to the stroke within the posterior circulation and the vertebral arteries it arises from the innominate artery on the right side and the subclavian artery on the left side and this vertebral artery has been divided into four segment b1 b2 b3 and b4 segment apart from the occlusion of the vertebral cerebral uh, vertebral artery the posterior inferior cerebral artery can also lead can also occlude which leads to the stroke within the posterior circulation now occlusion of the basilar artery so the basilar artery it supplies the base of the pons and the superior cerebellum and it falls into three groups paramedian short circumferential and the bilateral long circumferential so these are the branches which arises from the basilar artery and the basilar artery usually supplies the brain stem and the cerebellum and these are the branches of the basilar artery and occlusion of the basilar artery can occur due to athero thrombotic disease so atheromatous lesions occur anywhere anywhere along the basilar trunk but are more frequent in the proximal basilar and distal vertebral segments and the clinical picture depends upon the availability of retrograde collateral flow from the posterior terminating arteries and emboli from the heart or the proximal vertebral or basilar segments are more commonly responsible for the top of the basilar syndromes and whenever there is a complete basilar occlusion it leads to the constellation of bilateral long tract signs sensory and motor with signs of cranial nerve and cerebellar dysfunction now come to the uh, so this is the stroke within the anterior circulation and stroke within the posterior circulation so now come to the diagnostic part that is the imaging part in imaging first is the ct scan so identify or exclude the hemorrhage as the cause of the stroke and they identify the extra parenchymal hemorrhages neoplasms abscesses and other conditions masking as the stroke so this is the advantage of the ct scan first ct scan will help in differentiating whether the stroke is due to ischemia or due to hemorrhage second it will also exclude the mimics of the stroke whether mimics of the stroke can be due to malignancies any abscess or any other condition which can mask as the stroke so this is the advantage of the ct scan and ct scan obtained in the first several hours after an infarction generally shows no abnormality so the advantage of the ct scan is also only that it excludes the hemorrhage but it is not necessary that it will produce the 
uh, changes of infarction and in part may not be seen reliably for 24 to 48 hours suppose the patient has developed the stroke within hours and you go for ct scan it can exclude the hemorrhage but it cannot but in certain cases certain but there are more chances that it will not produce the infarction and ct scan may fail to show small ischemic stroke in the posterior fossa because of the bone artifact also on the cortical surface so these are the drawbacks of the ct scan when the stroke is in the posterior cerebral circulation so the contrast enhanced ct allows the visualization of venous structure and we uh, we can upgrade the ct from we can go for ct angiography which identifies the carotid disease and intracranial vascular occlusion area of the brain in fact ischemic penumbra after iv bolus of contrast and it is sensitive in detecting the subarachnoid hemorrhage so these are the advantages of ct angio over the conventional ct uh, ct but non contrast ct is the imaging modality of choice in patients with the acute stroke so whenever a patient of stroke presents to presents to you in emergency you should go for non contrast ct because it is easily av available easy to do and there are no any certain uh, different contraindications for non contrast ct this uh, mr now come to the further uh, work up we can go for mri which reliably documents the extent and location of the infarction in all areas of the brain including the posterior fossa and the cortical surface so these are there they are two drawbacks of the ct when the stroke is in the posterior circulation and when there is the involvement of the cortex these are not reliably documented by the ct but these structures can be uh, delineated by the mri so, so mri can lead to the stroke within the posterior fossa and these changes on the cortical surface but it is less sensitive than ct in detecting the acute blood so mri is less sensitive than ct in detecting the acute blood and there is some refinement of the mri that is known as the flare that is flare it is more sensitive for early brain infarction than the mr sequences or the ct so these are the advantages of flare over the conventional mri or the ct and MRI perfusion studies uses IV gadolinium contrast and I MR angiography it is highly sensitive for stenosis of extra cranial internal carotid arteries and large intracranial vessel so we can go for MR conventional apart from the conventional MRI we can go for MR angio also and MRI with fat saturation visualizes extra or intracranial arterial dissection so compared to the ct mri it is less sensitive for if we compare the ct versus mri so mri it is less sensitive for acute blood products it is more expensive time consuming less readily available and it is limited with claustrophobia so the certain patient will not go for mri because of the fear of uh, closed spaces which is known as the claustrophobia because a uh, ct scan usually takes 5 to 10 minutes but mri will take at least 30 to 40 minutes and there is a uh, very irritating sound of the magnetic uh, field uh, in the mri that's why some some patient will not tolerate the mri and they have to go for ct and we can upgrade the ct we can up, go for either the contrast ct or we can go for ct angio and mri it is more useful outside the acute period by more clearly defining the extent of tissue injury and discriminating new from the old regions of brain infarction so this is the advantage of mri from the ct suppose we have gone uh, gone for the ct in a patient of stroke and ct is normal so, so there might there might be chances either this either the lesions are not uh, clearly visible on the ct or they are not developed so we have to go for M, we have to go for mri second advantage is that ct will not uh, will not tell you whether this infarct is a it is a recent one or it is the old one but mri can differentiate whether it is a new infarct or it is a it is a old infarct and we can go for cerebral angiography also conventional x ray cerebral angiography it is the gold standard for identifying and quantifying the atherosclerotic stenosis of the cerebral arteries and characterizing the other pathologies and it is coupled with endovascular techniques for cerebral revascularization so cerebral angiography can be the diagnostic as well as the therapeutic also but there are certain risks with uh, cerebral angiography like arterial damage groin hemorrhage and embolic stroke and renal failure from contrast nephropathy
and it is reserved when the less invasive means are inadequate so usually cerebral angiography is done in selected cases apart from the ct mri and angiography we can go for ultrasound that is known as the transcranial doppler so tcd or the transcranial doppler it can detect stenotic lesions in the large intracranial arteries because such lesions increases the uh, systolic flow velocity so we can go for uh, doppler also it can assist thrombolysis and improve the large artery recanalization following the tpa administration so if we go for thrombolysis we can go we can see through the doppler whether the thrombolysis is successful or not apart from uh, doppler there are other techniques like known as the perfusion techniques so both genon techniques that is known as genon ct and pat they can quantify the cerebral blood flow they are generally used for the research but can be useful for determining the significance of arterial stenosis and planning for revascularization surgery and ct perfusion it increases the sensitivity of detecting the ischemia and it can measure the ischemic penumbra so we can go for perfusion techniques also so this is all about the ischemia now come in the short intracranial hemorrhage so intracranial hemorrhage means this hem there is a bleed within the brain and it can be of different types so hemorrhages are classified by their location and underlying vascular pathology so this is the classification based on the location first is the subdural hemorrhage and the epidural hemorrhage subdural means with the, uh, below the dura epidural means that that is the outside the dura that is the extra dural hemorrhage subdural and the epidural hemorrhages they are usually caused by the trauma subarachnoid hemorrhage that is below the arachnoid it is produced by the trauma and the rupture of intracranial aneurysm intraparenchymal and intraventricular hemorrhage that is within the brain intraparenchymal means within the brain parenchyma intraventricular means within the ventricles so these are the different types of hemorrhages epidural subdural subarachnoid intraparenchymal and intraventricular and diagnosis intracranial hemorrhage is often discovered on the non contrast ct imaging of the brain during the acute evaluation of stroke so these are can be easily diagnosed through the non contrast ct and ct it is preferred method for the acute stroke evaluation over mri since it is more sensitive on the acute blood and in the emergency management of intracranial hemorrhage same abc there is airway management blood pressure control and the pathway so airway reduction in the level of consciousness is common and progressive initial blood pressure is maintained until ct stain results are reviewed and the bp can be safely lowered using nitardipine libetalol or esmolol so if you are if the patient is having the intracranial hemorrhage and the blood pressure is high it can be safely reduced with the use of these drugs what are the advantages of these drugs these drugs reduces blood pressure very slowly they will not produce very rapid uh, fall in of blood pressure because the very rapid fall of blood pressure can leads to the more damage rather than the beneficial part and usually the blood pressure is not made normal to made normal it is usually remains slightly above the normal so we have to reduce the blood pressure from uh, any and uh, which uh, if the patient is having a high reading of systolic blood pressure it is usually re reduced up to 150 160 and the diastolic is reduced up to 100 to 110 so this is the normal pressure but the mean arterial pressure is should be less than 130 mm mercury unless an increase in intracranial pressure is suspected and stuporous or comatose patient generally are treated presumptively for elevated intracranial pressure with tracheal intubation hyperventilation manitol and elevation of the head of the bed this manitol if act as a diuretic and it reduces the cerebral edema and this intraparenchymal hemorrhage it is the most common type of intracranial hemorrhage particularly high in the asians and the black the major causes of intraparenchymal hemorrhage are the hypertension trauma cerebral amyloid angiopathy and risk factors are the advanced age heavy alcohol consumption cocaine and meth meth amphetamine use and this cocaine and meth amphetamine use is most common most important cause in the young so the intraparenchymal hemorrhage is the most common type of intracranial hemorrhage and hypertensive intraparenchymal hemorrhage it usually results from the spontaneous rupture of small penetrating artery deep in the brain it can also be due to hemorrhage disorders neoplasm vascular malformations and the most common sites are the basal ganglia so the basal ganglia is the most common site when you are suspecting the intraparenchymal hemorrhage and in basal ganglia especially the putamen
and other sites are the thalamus cerebellum and pons and this hemorrhage may lead to the herniation and death and most develops over 30 to 90 minutes compared to the hemorrhage caused by the anticoagulant therapy which evolved for 24 to 48 hours